But I think that it is likely, or that there is at least a strong likelihood that Russia is going to hit Kiev. I will not be surprised to see one day European people doing revolutions and killing politicians. Here we are, guys. The same garbage. It's a repetition of the same damn Cold War thing. The Cold War insanity that just seems to never end. Uh, the Cold War supposedly ended back in the 1990s. Ronald Reagan said, oh, Gorbachev, tear down the wall. And East and West Germany were reunited. And so the Cold War, it was declared over. But apparently it's not over. There's a big difference between the Cold War generation and our generation. The generation that's the younger or the young generation right now or the semi-old generation, like the millennial generation. The difference is that we don't really want war. We're not enthusiastic about the idea of war with Russia. Uh, if you are enthusiastic about going to war with Russia, you're more than likely a boomer or you're some sort of a NATO activist, psychopath, uh, citizen of Sodom and an acolyte of the Antichrist. Uh, in fact, if you are a super pro-NATO guy, I'm going to say it. It's not like you're probably an acolyte of the Antichrist. It is that you're an, <laughs> you're an acolyte of the Antichrist. Uh, NATO is just uh, unhinged. It really is unhinged. Because yesterday, as all of you guys all know, uh, the United States... The United States watched as Ukraine used... American-made Attackum missiles, long-range missiles, deep into Russia. Yep, the Ukrainians launched them. And you have the hoorah, hoorah, John McCain demons, these psychopaths, these lunatics, and they're just egging the Ukrainians on. They're encouraging this behavior. They're encouraging it. And you have this... This sicko, Care Starmer. I mean, this guy's a sick bastard. This Care Starmer guy. Oh, he's a sicko. But Care Starmer has been very enthusiastic about the idea of Ukrainians launching British missiles, British made missiles, deep into Russia. And Joe Biden uh, just days ago said, uh, Ukraine uh, has the green light to uh, uh, launch missiles in into Russia. And the British were ecstatic. The French were ecstatic. Emmanuel Macron, that psychopath, that, that lunatic, he was ecstatic. Oh yes, very, very ecstatic. And so Keir Starmer, he supported this idea. And today it has been reported that the Ukrainians have used now British missiles. So yesterday they used American missiles, now they're using British missiles. And I spent some time reading about this, these British missiles, they're called uh, Storm Shadow Cruise Missiles, something like that. It doesn't really matter. They're all just weapons. What matters is that they're made by NATO and Ukraine is using them. Yeah, that's right. And the Russians have said, if Ukraine is using NATO country made missiles, then we consider that attack to be a direct attack from that NATO country or from a nuclear country. So America is a nuclear power. Great Britain is a nuclear power. And you have the Ukrainians using what? American missiles, Ukrainian missiles, or sorry, a British missiles. And the Russians have said, if Ukraine is going to start using weapons against Russia, Russia itself, by using weapons made by nuclear powers, we're going to consider that attack to be directly from those nuclear powers. And that's what has gotten everyone, everyone freaked out. Everyone's freaking out. Everyone's talking about how NATO is leading us to destruction. <laughs> how NATO countries are leading us to destruction, specifically, of course, the United States and also, in this case, Great Britain. Well, in every case, in every case, Great Britain. Now, the 
pro-NATO media, the establishment media, has been saying, well, this is a response to North Korean soldiers entering the conflict against the Ukrainians. But the Ukrainians invaded Russia before that. And the Ukrainians who entered Russian soil were trained by NATO. They were trained by the British. And they were trained by the Canadians and the Americans. These, oh, the, the, the Ukrainians have been getting training from the Americans, from the Canadians, from the British, from the Anglosphere. And they don't give a damn if these Ukrainians are Sieg Heil Nazis. They don't give a damn because it's about fighting Russia. Now, these Western countries, they'll talk about fighting racism. Racism, bad. Fascism, bad. Yes, that's true. Racism, fascism, Nazism, bad. Absolutely. Then why in the hell are you training Ukrainian neo-Nazis? And you can say, well, Russia started all this stuff, so Russia's the bad guy, so really, by any means necessary to fight against Russia, we're going to do it, Nazi or not. We're going to use the Nazis. It doesn't matter because we got to fight Russia because... Russia started this. And this is the the crazy, insane line of thinking that we're seeing. Because I saw this video that came out recently. Keir Starmer is being uh, challenged by a hardball question by a journalist. Are you worried about a nuclear response from Russia? Because you're so crazy about the idea of Ukraine hitting Russia using British missiles. Are you not concerned about a nuclear response from Russia. And what did Keir Starmer say with his sicko look? He, has, he looks like a sicko with the glasses and everything. The guy looks sick. He said, it's Russia that started all of this. It's Russia that invaded a country. It's Russia that did, that did this. It's Russia that did awful. We're trying to stop an invader. That's what we're trying to stop. To do Just that. quickly, um, Russia has also threatened uh, nuclear escalation. Are you comfortable with that when people at home are watching this, worrying that you could put us in ri at risk? Well, it's very nuclear important. War? It's very important that we're steadfast in our support for Ukraine. Russia is the aggressor. Uh, Even and if Russia, unleashes nuclear war? Russia uh, has to be the one that makes the move to stop this war. It's within their gift. But we must support Ukraine. It's impacting not just Ukraine, it's impacting the rest of the is world, your, including the UK. Is your message but, to viewers back home that there will not be a nuclear war? Because that is what Russia is threatening. My message is that we need to ensure that Ukraine is put in the best possible position. This is a thousand days of conflict. Okay. Uh, and there is a very high cost if Russian aggression is seen to pay off. Did not the West support a revolution against Yanukovych? in ukraine did not the west back these nazis in ukraine against pro-russian fighters in the donbass was it not these sickos in ukraine who were persecuting ethnic russians in the donbass and was it not nato who was working with the ukrainian military to fight against russia years before the russians went into ukraine to do its special operation Let's not sit here and pretend that NATO is just innocent and wasn't doing anything to provoke Russia. And NATO has a history of this. The West has a history of this. The West has a very, very long history of trying to devastate and weaken and crush Russia. You can go back to Napoleon. You can go back to Sweden when the Swedes invaded Russia. And yes, they had a major, major final battle with the Russians where? In Ukraine. The Swedes wanted Ukraine. They wanted to defeat Russia. The Germans and the Austrians tried to crush Russia during the First World War. And they tried to crush Russia during the Second World War. And here we are seeing the same damn thing over again. It's why I say the thing that we never learn from history is that we don't learn from history because the damn thing keeps repeating itself. The wheel keeps on turning. And what I, from what I have read, the Ukrainians fired 12 of these British missiles. And from what I understand, no significant damage has been done. I read that the Russians managed to shoot down some of these missiles. And uh, there is a video that you can see, or multiple videos, I think, uh, uh, where you can hear 
multiple explosions and fragments of these missiles have been found by Russian civilians. So what's the response going to be on the part of Russia? We have yet to see, but, but the US embassy put out a warning for all US citizens living in Ukraine saying, hey, be prepared for electrical blackouts, save a whole bunch of water bottles, keep a good storage of water bottles, and also make sure that you know where all of the bomb shelters are. Yep, that's what the Americans told their citizens who are living in Ukraine. Make sure you know where all the bomb shelters are. And I think they're really, really talking about Kiev. So it is, there is a likelihood. I'll just put it that way because I can't tell you emphatically about the future. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a, an observer. But I think that it is likely or that there is at least a strong likelihood that Russia is going to hit Kiev and they're going to let the West know, hey, you can't mess with us. Now, last night I did a video basically saying that there's a chance, there's a possibility that Biden or whoever is behind Biden, the people with the, the black hoods on, if you know what I mean, uh, told the Ukrainians that they can hit the Russians with American-made missiles, that they can actually hit the Russians in Russian soil using American-made missiles. And I asked the question, I posed the question, well, why now? Why is it that for all this time, you can go back to last year and you can read about how the Ukrainians were begging the Americans for permission to use these attack of missiles to launch directly into Russian territory. And the Americans said, no, we don't want you to do that. And then now, Months before Trump is about to take office, the Americans give the green light to the Ukrainians. The British give the green light. The French are supporting it. Why now? And I made a parallel to what happened before Reagan entered office. There was the infamous Iran hostage crisis, and Carter was trying to make a deal with the Iranians. The Iranians were toying with Carter. They weren't releasing the hostages. Carter looked weak. And then right when Reagan entered office, boom, the Iranians released the hostages. And to this day, this myth of the tenacious Ronald Reagan lives on. And people really believe that the Iranians were so scared shitless of Reagan that Reagan just came in, he put his balls on the table, and the Iranians were so terrified of this guy that they released the hostages. And the reality was much, much more interesting than that. The reality uh, was that Reagan's people, amongst whom was George Bush Sr. and the head of the CIA, the head of the CIA at that time, Bill Casey, uh, were telling the Iranians, "Listen, the Americans, we and the Israelis, we're gonna make uh, arms deals with you. With you, we're gonna do arms deals with you. You're gonna get some really good firepower from us. We know that you wanna go out and fight the uh, Iraqis. So you're, you're gonna fight the Iraqis, and you know, there was a war between Iraq and Iran." And so we're going to sell arms to you. The Israelis are going to sell arms to you. But we want you to do something for us. We want you to just uh, keep these American hostages as hostages until Reagan enters office. That way we can boost up the image of Reagan. We really like Reagan because Reagan is a cold warrior. He's a cold war guy. He's very anti-Russia, anti-Soviet Union. We need this guy right now. We don't need some lefty snowflake and so the iranians happily obliged so they kept the american hostages as hostages then right when reagan entered office oh mr reagan how oh, we're so scared and they released the hostages and reagan to this day is praised as this heroic watershed landmark of a president and so you see what's happening today. Now, I still hold that this could be a possibility, that what the Americans are doing is something similar to what they did before, uh, when Reagan, before Reagan entered office and right when he entered office. I think it's still a possibility that the Americans want to pull out of this conflict. And so they want to bolster up the image of Trump. They want to terrify the American people and other Western uh, peoples. There are some freaking sirens going uh, 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 going on right now outside. They're just flaring up outside. I can hear them. I don't think you guys can hear them, but th this shit is distracting. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Are the Russians invading already? What the hell is going on? I keep hearing these sirens, man. They're, they're super close. It's getting me a little bit paranoid here, you know? 
doing these videos, man, you have to really, really focus. And uh, it's it's easy to be distracted when you're doing these videos. Your brain is uh, distracted by the fact that you're talking to a cold machine. I have to remember that I'm actually talking to humans. I'm not talking to a cold, dead machine. So uh, a little bit of brain work here. Uh, but it's possible that they just want to bolster up the image of Trump. They want everyone in, in, in America, they want everyone in the UK, the United Kingdom, to be freaking out about a war with Russia. So that way when Trump comes in, oh, the, the relief comes. And Trump will come out and say, listen... Let's allow cooler heads to prevail. Let's make a peace deal. And and perhaps this is what's happening, right? They want to bolster up the image of Trump just like they bolstered up the image of Reagan by making people terrified of the Iranians killing American hostages, by making people think that Carter was this weakling and terrible leader, and by making people think that Reagan was so tough, so tenacious, so intimidating to the to the Iranians that they were so terrified of this guy, they were pissing blood at the very sight of him that they released the hostages as soon as he entered office. Perhaps there's a certain image that the powers that be want to project. Perhaps. We don't know. I can't prove it. But what I do believe is that there is an escalation. I don't believe that NATO and Russia are friends. Obviously not. Although they will maintain some limitations as to what they can and cannot do against each other. But those boundaries are dissipating as we speak. They're breaking apart. And they're breaking apart because NATO is filled with psychopaths. You have these John McCain types. And these people are from the old guard. They're from the old establishment. I'm looking at a timer right now because I have a loaf of bread in the oven. I don't want it to, uh, I don't want it to burn. So I'm looking at a timer. I might have to uh, stop this video and come back. But uh, these neocon cold warrior types, they are part of the old guard. And what you see going on right now is this rise of a new way of thinking, which is anti-war anti-interventionism, pro-isolationism. And I saw a video on Twitter of a British man just having a damn near panic attack on Twitter slash X. I mean, the guy, the poor guy, I really feel bad for him. And he's like, he's like, fucking Keir Starmer, this fucking bastard cunt. He just allowed the, the Ukrainians to launch British made storm shadow missiles into ukraine and now he's gonna get all of us fucking killed mate russia and this is what the guy says russia if you're gonna fucking hit the uk man hit this fucking bloody bastard cunt Keir Starmer. that's what this guy is saying play the clip oh no 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 ukraine have just fired uk storm shadow missiles into russia 24 hours after Vladimir Putin vowed a nuclear response should the UK or US do so. Dozy motherfucker Rodney! He hasn't even announced that he authorized the use of these fucking missiles. He's just gone and fucking done it without telling anyone! Shout out to Vladimir Putin, can you not go for like the general public or send any missiles to where the general public will be hurt or harmed? Just go for these fucking pricks! Just go for these fucking wankers that are making these decisions! We all in the UK fucking hate him! We fucking hate him! The Russian media have reported that 12 missiles were launched by Ukrainian aircraft in the Kursk region, which they identified to be Storm Shadow missiles. There's no word yet of how many of these missiles hit their target or if all were intercepted. People saying we shouldn't worry about Putin, we shouldn't worry about nuclear, he won't do this, he won't do that, blah blah blah. You motherfuckers ain't living in London! Next to fucking Heathrow Airport. You're probably living up in the fucking mountains of Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. Where no missiles will fucking go to. Ugh, just where is this going? What's gonna happen next? For fuck's sake. And this, this guy, what he's expressing, what he's saying, it really reflects how almost all of us are feeling. And if you are getting giddy and excited and your jollies are getting all hyped up and flared up at the idea of going to war with Russia, either you've never experienced war, you're a psychopath, or really just both at the same time, regardless. And you're an asshole. Uh, so you see, what's happening right now is the peasants are sick and tired of the uh, of the nobles. The peasant, and you're seeing this in various, you're really seeing this in all factors of society, media, uh, politics, culture. You're seeing this in all the various facets of human society. And you have the old guard that's pro-anti-Russia, pro-anti-Russia. They're pro going against Russia. They're super pro-NATO. But then you have the average people, people like myself, people like you, 
who just want to live life. I mean, life is not that long. We're not really on this earth for that long. And the older you get, the faster time goes. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I've, I've noticed this. I'm looking at the calendar every day and I start getting little minor panic attacks. I'm like, wait, it's November what already? Yeah, that's right. It's November 18th or whatever. Like, what the hell? Man, time is just accelerating. What's the date? I have to look it up. What's the date today? Is it really? I'm going to freak myself. It's November 20th. Oh, my God. I, I I guessed wrong. I said the 18th. That's how fast time is accelerating, guys. We're not on this earth for a long time. And you have these fat bastards in suits who say, well, we got to you know, Russia. They invaded a country. And and is that, is that the real reason why you want to go to war with Russia? Because they invaded a country? They did what? War crimes? Israel's doing war crimes. And you don't give a shit. You know who else is doing war crimes? The UAE is doing war crimes as we speak by backing a bunch of rapists and mass murderers in Sudan. They're called the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces. They are a UAE-backed paramilitary organization, or organization, and they are they are uh, Arab. They are Afro-Semitic supremacists who think that they are superior to the other Africans because they have I don't know one eightieth, one two hundredth of a drop of Arab blood running through their veins, and they think that they're Allah's greatest gift to mankind, and so they think they have a right to rape and murder people by the thousands. And they went into one area in uh, in Darfur. Yeah, you can go read about this. You know how many people they butchered. 15,000 people in one massacre these RSF guys did. And who's backing them? Our good friend, the UAE. And why is the UAE backing them? Oh, it's because the RSF gives the UAE plenty of that Sudanese gold. And why does America not tell the UAE, hey, UAE, you got to stop backing mass murderers and rapists? Because the UAE is right on the Strait of Hormuz, which is more than likely, from what I understand, the most important transit point for the exportation of oil. So, oh, Russia, Russia, uh, they invaded a country. So now we have to start a major escalation. The reason why you hate Russia is because Russia is one of the few countries on this earth that can give the big middle finger to the United States. Let's be real here. It is a self-sufficient country. It can grow its own food. It doesn't sit there and import everything that it needs. It has oil. It has natural gas. I believe it has gold. Correct me on that if I'm wrong. But it has everything that it needs to survive. And it can give the big fat middle finger to the United States. And they can sell a whole bunch of wheat and oil and natural gas to other countries. And they're fine. They can work with African countries. They work with India. They can work with various other nations. China, its biggest partner is China, which is the second most wealthiest country on the freaking earth. So Russia's like, we give you the middle finger. Why Why did NATO destroy Yugoslavia? You think NATO destroyed Yugoslavia because oh, the Serbs were war criminals? The Bosnians had war criminals. The Albanians had war criminals. The Croatians had war criminals. And yet NATO backed the Croatians in Operation Storm. They backed the KLA. The Germans also backed the KLA. They backed the Bosnians. Why did America destroy Yugoslavia? Why did Germany work so hard to destroy Yugoslavia by backing the KLA in Kosovo? It's because Yugoslavia was, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia was the last big block of geopolitical power that was basically giving the middle finger to the United States. So that was another thing that America needed to dismantle. Bottom line, that's what it was. The Yugoslavia said, okay, we'll play this game where we'll be nice with the Americans, we'll be nice with the Russians, and we'll, we'll, we'll play this sort of third-way geopolitics, and we'll be fine. We'll, we'll get American weapons, we'll do trade deals with the United States, we'll be nice with the Russians, and we're good. We're not going to be aggressive towards the Americans, and that shit didn't work. That did not work. And so what's happening is the peasants are getting pissed off. They're sick and tired of these elites doing crazy shit like trying to drag us into war and escalating things and messing with Russia. They're sick of it. People just want to live their lives. I want to live my life. Look at me. I just want a garden and baked sourdough bread. I, I would love just to do videos about video games. Like, here's my opinion about Elden Ring and why I 
this is why I love Elden Ring. This is why I hate Elden Ring. Here's my opinion about the Resident Evil 4 remake. Let's talk about how shitty Gladiator 2 was. And I love talking about those topics. In fact, I love talking about mundane topics such as video games and sourdough starters than I do talking about this bullshit going on in Europe. Why? Because I love the idea that life is simple and boring and mundane and that nothing crazy is about to happen. So that's why I think a lot of people get into video games and movies. And that's why I think a lot of people watch video game uh, videos and reviews about video games and reviews about films and things like that. Because it's just a way to tell our brains, listen, everything is normal. See how mundane everything is. We're talking about video games and computer games and World of Warcraft and Elden Ring. We're talking about... Uh, Black Wukong, whatever, some Chinese game that's beating the other video games. We're talking about all this stuff. We're talking about Total War Medieval 2. And we're talking about uh, the DLC for Elden Ring. We're, we're talking about all these things. Wow. Life is so, so expected. Life is so just boring and safe. And yeah, I kind of like this. And I like this. And and it, and it calms us down. And then one day you, you just wake up and you look at your phone and you read, uh, Kara Starmer says that he is getting so giddy and excited about the idea of British missiles hitting Russia and, ex and accelerating the conflict and escalating things. And Putin is now saying he will strike back. So here we are, uh, pretending as if Ukraine actually has a fighting chance. And recently, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky did an interview with uh, Fox News. And I'm shocked that I didn't really see uh, any Western mainstream media outlets talking about the sensitive topics that Zelensky covered in this interview. But I did find it on Twitter, slash X. And I did find it in the Russian media. Basically, Zelensky told this Fox News interviewer that Ukraine does not have the capacity to regain all of Ukrainian territory. That Ukraine does not have the military capacity to bring Ukraine back to its 1991 borders. And that if the West cuts off its aid, that Ukraine is done. I was already mentioning that we are ready to bring Crimea back diplomatically. We cannot spend dozens of thousands of our people so that they perish for the sake of Crimea and come back. And still, it's not the fact that we can bring it back with the arms in our hands. So we understand that Crimea can be brought back diplomatically. I want to ask you about some comments you made regarding possible negotiations last week. You said the U.S. can't force you to sit at the negotiating table. What if the U.S. government cuts military funding to Ukraine? If they will cut, we will, I think we will lose. Of course, anyway, we will, we will stay, we will fight. We have our production, but it's not enough to prevail. And I think it's not enough to survive. But uh, that will be, if such choice will be American choice. So we will decide what we will have to do. And so the Ukrainians can't win this war without the West. That goes without saying, right? Everyone knows this. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Are we going to just continue this conflict and just continue it on and perpetuate it to the last Ukrainian? Or are we going to come to a ceasefire agreement and allow cooler heads to prevail, at least temporarily, because this thing's not going to end, guys. It's not going to end. This, this this craziness, it's just going to resume from where it left off if there is a ceasefire agreement. And Putin has made himself very clear. He has said, I am not going to give up territory that Russia has conquered. And I think this is the reason why Ukraine entered Kursk, why Ukraine invaded Russia. And I think this is the reason why the United States gave the green light to the Ukrainians to hit Russians in their own territory, in within their own borders. It's so that when or if the West and Russia come together in the negotiating table, that the Ukrainians that the Ukrainians can argue that, hey, you want something from us, we want something from you, and you're gonna want us to leave Russia, you're gonna want us to leave Kursk, and you're gonna want us to not hit Russia 
And so we're going to give this to you, but we want something in return. So it, in other words, it's a way to give Ukraine a stronger negotiating point, a stronger hand in the negotiating table. And I've read this and some uh, observers have made this uh, analysis, but we have yet to see. We don't know the future. But what I want to emphasize on here, and I'm trying to be as calm as I can because you know it's, it's times are getting very surreal. What I want to emphasize on in this video is what's happening in Western societies. The peasants are beginning to revolt. The peasants are rising up against the elites. And there is a major transition that's happening in society. And you see this in various facets of society, really all facets, politics, media, culture, where if you're for interventionism and if you're for military involvement in any conflict, you're considered a psychopath and an elitist. You should be seen in that way because life is too short to be getting involved in this craziness. And you see so much anger coming from the public in Western countries against this interventionist ideology. And I'm glad, I'm very glad. And I hope that this unpopularity becomes so strong. I hope that this dislike for this ideology becomes so strong that politicians will have no choice but to eschew it uh, because of its absence or because of its heavy lack in popularity. And it's not just anger against interventionism, but it's anger against these liberal policies, especially when it comes to immigration, migration, mass migration into Western countries. So there is a story that you can read coming from the German media. And this is an absolutely insane ass story. It's so insane. It, it makes you wonder if it's done, if this story happened because elites want to create a provocation to get the peasants riled up, to get the, the average folks riled up. A girl in Germany was gang raped by nine males, one of whom was an adult. The rest of them were were classified as teenagers so uh they said that they had to be punished as delinquents as youths as opposed to adults the one adult rapist was uh, treated accordingly in accordance to the german law and the rape victim described the adult rapist as a freak as basically an abomination and the german government said ah you have broken the law. You have broken the law. You're not supposed to call someone a freak. That's defamation. And I couldn't believe what I was reading. The rape victim got a harsher punishment than the adult rapist. And that's on top of the fact that she was raped by nine. I'm going to I'm going to call them men. Oh, well, they're actually technically uh, eight children and one adult. They're all I'm, I'm going to say they're all monsters males i'm just gonna say male. they're not even men i can't call them men i shouldn't call them men males she was gang raped by nine males and she was treated harsher than the adult rapist because she called him a something like a freakish monster and you wonder why people are rising up against the elites you wonder why you see this plebeian uprising just building up in the western world and you see it happening, and we have been seeing it happening in Germany, in France, with the Yellow Vest movement. We saw the UK riots because people in the UK are sick and tired of hearing about rape and crime. Now, what the rioters did was wrong, and I've always stood against it. But what's been going on in the UK is an environment where people see things like rioting as a good thing because they're so sick and tired of the crime and the rape and all of these horrendous actions being done by members of ethnic minorities. And I know that most ethnic minorities aren't rapists, but the thing is that these stories have been going on for too long and these stories have been disseminated on, in, on the internet for too long. It's just people, people just say, okay, well, what else are we going to do? And this is the, this is what makes this whole thing so dangerous is that people are starting to turn to ideologies that were once considered fanatical and unacceptable people are starting to look up to adolf hitler 
Why? Because they hear about all this crime being done and all these types of terrible things being done. And the the mainstream politicians want to act like everything is fine. They want to act like things are things are going okay when they're not. And people are telling them, hey, stop this nonsense with Russia. Stop all this idea of becoming more and more aggressive towards Russia because we're the ones who are going to suffer if we end up in, a, in the midst of a bloody conflict with the Russians. And these politicians don't listen. They don't care. Oh, no, no. We can use British uh, storm shadow missiles against Russia. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just don't care. So what you see happening is this buildup of peasant rage. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not using the word peasant as a pejorative or as an insult or in any demeaning way. It's just a way to say the regular folks. And Europe has had many peasant revolts. You can go back to the medieval period and you can read about numerous peasant, uh, peasant revolts that took place. Uh, the one that pops up in my head is the peasant revolt that occurred basically nearing the end of the 100 years war there was an irish guy by the name of jack cade and he led a peasant revolt against the british or the english government uh and the peasants were angry that the english government was not paying the soldiers uh and they were also angry that the english were losing territory to the french this was at the end of the war right before the english lost to the french and so there was a peasant revolt and they went around and they were, uh, I think, butchering uh, members of the elite class and things of that sort. And this has happened in European history many times. And you have had pogroms, you have had revolts against officials and politicians. And they're ugly. They are absolutely ugly. And what are you seeing on the Internet? People are getting more and more fanatical. People are becoming radicalized. It's hard to blame people for getting angry. Now, I will blame people for resorting to fascist ideology. That's a crazy choice to make. We have, we as human beings are much more balanced that we don't have to go to Hitlerian ideas. But I don't blame people for being angry. Hell, I get angry when I read about this stuff. Absolutely. But the thing is, because you can't really blame people for being angry, the danger is that a lot of people get this sense that they're justified in subscribing to destructive ideologies, things that are Hitlerian, evil, violent. And that's why you see, when you read about the UK riots that happened this year, you will read about mobs going out and destroying people's businesses because the business owners were not white. They were Middle Eastern or just not white. And there was one case I read about in Northern Ireland where a mob of people destroyed a guy's store because the store was a Middle Eastern shop. And there was one another case I read where I want to say a Middle Eastern restaurant was sacked because it was a Middle Eastern restaurant. And so you can't convince me that you're justified in acting in such a way because you're simply responding to acts of violence. You're coming out and you're saying, we're sick and tired of violence. Okay, so what's your solution? We're going to act violent towards civilians. That's insane. But I can't blame people for being angry. And in Germany earlier this year, you had this major farmers demonstration. And I want to say that there was a there was a politician, a German politician by the name of Robert ha uh, Habeck. And I want to say that he was almost attacked. Let me just make... Uh, Yep, I was right, yeah. So Robert Habeck, the vice chancellor of Germany, he was almost attacked by an angry mob of German farmers. This is this is on the verge of a peasant revolt. You're seeing it. And it's not just in the political realm of society. It's also in the media realm. And I was looking at this video uh, today, earlier today, about how Joe Rogan was able to defeat and crush the mainstream media. Joe Rogan and other podcasters slash streamers are literally defeating the mainstream media as we speak. Gold is winning more against the mainstream media. Ro uh, uh, Joe Rogan, I mean, a lot of these types of guys, they're dominating the media space because people are sick and tired of the bullshit that was going on from the mainstream media. And I was thinking about this last night. My father was attacked by CNN. 
one of the biggest mainstream media outlets on earth. It's super wealthy, super big, super everything. And my dad was attacked by CNN. And CNN did a two-day series, a two-part series that they played within two days, so one episode for each day, against my father, saying that my father uh, is a liar. Because my father was a member of the PLO. He was a terrorist against the Israeli government. And my father put a bomb uh, in an Israeli or on top of his on top of an Israeli bank. And the reason why he put it on top of his, of an Israeli bank as opposed to inside of the bank was because he had the bomb in his hands. His palms were sweating. He was absolutely terrified. And uh, he freaked out and he just threw the bomb so high that it went on top of the roof of the bank. And then he ran away and it blew up. My father stayed in bed for three straight days in a state of extremely deep and dark depression because he had realized that he he could have killed somebody he was terrified of the fact that he may have actually killed somebody and one day a friend of my father's came to visit him and he said you know people are talking about this bomb that went off and my dad said well did anybody die and he said no no one died and my dad just my dad told me he, he felt this 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 big pile of bricks just being lifted from his chest because he was so terrified of the idea that he may have killed someone and it didn't matter if they were Jew or Palestinian he didn't want to kill anyone he realized oh my god like what the f am I doing this is insane so my father went on to this road that eventually led him away from this life of Islamic fanaticism and terrorism and he found Jesus Christ and he converted to Christianity so my father became really the first person to come out as an ex-Muslim and also as an ex-terrorist and uh, and speak as a as a celebrity talker. And uh, my father did major speaking tours in various parts of the world. And for a while, my dad was actually a celebrity. In 2000 and I want to say 11 or 2010, CNN did this documentary about my father saying that my dad was a fraudster. And they used really no evidence. They just said, well, we called up the bank and they said they don't really know about a terrorist attack. And, oh, he's a fraudster. And it's like, it's like you called up some some random bank employee and say, hey, do you remember if a bomb went off in 19 whatever? I think it was 1970 something or whatever. Uh, uh, you think people have difficulty remembering 9-11 nowadays. But they used that as evidence. And my father went to CNN and brought them all this evidence for his terrorist past and my dad had an email correspondence with CNN and they didn't give a shit they never went back and said hey uh, Waleed that's my dad's name came back and gave us all this evidence and so we're going to present the evidence they didn't give a shit Anderson Cooper was talking shit about my dad uh, some other asshole Mr. Uh, Griffin or whatever his name was was talking shit about my father they lied and no one gave a damn so they were lying they lie about people now most of the time i would say the mainstream media is fine you can read reports and about current events and you can learn something but they lie about people and one day the media lied about the biggest dog in the park joe rogan they lied about that guy they said well because joe joe rogan got covid he took uh, ivermectin and cnn said he's taking horse dewormer ha 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 and they played this video of joe rogan talking about ivermectin and they purposefully changed the shade of color on joe rogan's face to make his skin look yellow to make him look sick and they mocked him and they made fun of him and they tried to make him look bad and joe rogan came out and said actually no i'm using a form of ivermectin that's that was prescribed to me or that was given to me by an actual legitimate doctor and actually tons of people take this medication and they're fine and it actually helps them and he this guy's not a doctor rogan is not a medical expert and he made cnn look ridiculous and not only that but he got a ton of people to hate the mainstream media even more the mainstream media was already unpopular at that point but rogan made it even more unpopular because he basically got people to think oh my god i hated the mainstream media before but now my hatred is even more confirmed and justified thanks to joe rogan and the media empire 
it was collapsing before, but Rogan hit it with the mother of all bombs, figuratively speaking. And he, figuratively speaking, did a... <laughs> he did a Hiroshima and Nakazaki on the mainstream media. It was down, and he put it down even more. The firebombing of Germany, Joe Rogan figuratively did that to the mainstream media. And now you see this massive revolt of the people against another aspect of mainstream society. And I will not be surprised. And I said this back in 2018 when you had the Yellow Vest movement covering the streets of Paris. I will not be surpri surprised to see one day European people doing revolutions and killing politicians. I wouldn't be surprised at all. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's good. I'm just speaking as an observer. It will not shock me to see a French style revolution in Europe. I'm not going to say it's going to, I'm not saying it's going to happen in every European country, but I won't be surprised to see it in just one European country. And I remember seeing a video of French people taking, going into a government building, taking a, a, a framed photograph of Macron throwing it out the window and the crowd of people in front of the building cheering and clapping their hands. I remember seeing it. And I'm thinking those people really want to do that to Macron himself. It's not just a photo. They're doing it to a photo, but they really want to do that to Macron. And I remember reading about how these French protesters were bringing little mock guillotines. Well, what, what's that about? They're expressing their desire to kill politicians. And I remember years ago seeing a video of Steve Bannon the right-wing guy who used to run uh, Breitbart, which was at one point in time the biggest right-wing media outlet on earth. And he was very close to Trump. And I remember seeing a video of Bannon saying that if he could, he would have Fauci beheaded and his head put on a stake and left outside of the White House for all to see, to instill hearts into the fears, to instill fear into the hearts of his political enemies. And that's the second term. Second term kicks off with firing Ray, firing Fauci. Now, I actually want to go a step farther, but I realize the president is a kind-hearted man and a good man. I'd actually like to go back to the old uh, times of Tudor England. I'd put the heads on pikes, right? I'd put them at the two corners of the White House as a warning to federal bureaucrats. You either get with the program or you're gone. Oh, yeah. The ideologies of the past... The ideologies from the 18th century, from the mid 20th century, it's coming back. Hitler's making a comeback. Hey, good afternoon, guys. You know, I was thinking about how everything that has happened to Germany before the Second World War in the early 1900s is happening to us now. And we're not allowed to talk about it. We're undergoing political, financial, and moral corruption through this Israeli mob who has successfully colonized our country by conquering every pivotal cultural pillar of influence here. From big tech, academia, Hollywood, entertainment, my industry, the fine arts sphere, real estate, and obviously banking. That's 6% of the U.S. population who rejects Christianity, running the infrastructure of 80 to 90% of the narrative. In the 1930s, Berlin was an absolute degenerate cesspool of boys in drag, being prostituted and castrated, spearheaded by Magnus Hirschfeld and the other psychologists behind the Institute of Sexual Sciences, which was bankrolled by the same Jewish mob that continues to peddle pornography and wide-scale revisionism onto all of our classics that denote any semblance of proper masculine and feminine archetypal roles. And speaking of bankrolling, simultaneously as all this lasciviousness took place, the Rothschild Bank forced the German populace to live under the shadow of its usury and debt-based banking, crippling the economy into hyperinflation. Sounds a lot like what's around the corner with the Federal Reserve, right? We talk about modern parallels to Rome when trying to rectify monumental societal changes, but we actually don't even have to look that far. Hitler rose to power preaching for Christian values, preserving racial and national boundaries, functioning in a market outside the Rothschild debt-based system, like Bitcoin, and standing up against wide-scale degeneracy and immorality, to the point of literally burning the sinful collection of the Institute of Sexual Sciences. How did this happen? A class of powerful, fearless, influential, and based men who prioritized speaking the truth and standing up for what's right over financial security, banded together as leaders of the country and rejected all of the toxicity. And that is why even though the Fuhrer tried to call for peace, the drunkard puppet of the Rothschilds, Winston Churchill, forced Great Britain to strike first.
People are resorting to fanatical ideas that were once believed to be confined to the realm of the past, but they are coming back. They're coming back. Why? Because the so-called elites became way too comfortable. They became way too arrogant. They became way too excessive in their liberalism. And so what's happening is a response that's the opposite extreme in a way. So for a long time, immigration was presented as a great thing. Uh, uh, allowing migrants to come in willy-nilly, nonchalantly, in excess was considered a good thing. Oh, they're going to bring employment, they're going to bring labor, they're going to bring all these good things. It's going to be great for our economy. And crime went up, and the people said, we're, we've had enough, we're tired of this. But it kept on going, and it keeps on going, and the crime keeps on happening. Crime increases in these Western countries. And the people say, we've had enough, stop, stop. And the elites are unbalanced. There's no balance. They're excessive. The same thing with the media. At one point in time, MSNBC and CNN, believe it or not, were balanced. Fox News was balanced at one point in time. They had Hannity and they had Combs. Hannity was the conservative. Combs was the liberal who was there to balance Hannity, who was there to act as a counter to Hannity. There was balance. Hannity supported the Iraq war. Combs told him that the Iraq war was was wrong and a terrible idea and Combs was right and I debated Alan Combs years ago back in I want to say 2015 and I told Alan Combs Combs I remember watching you when I was in middle school and I remember watching how you told Hannity that, that, that the Iraq war was a terrible idea and you were right Mr. Combs I told him that you have to give credit to where credit is due and MSNBC used to have a show hosted by Michael Savage there was balance then what happened? These lefties, these liberals, they, they started thinking, well, look, liberalism is the future. We're dominating the culture. People love the LGBT. Look how great we are. We're so influential. The conservatives are dinosaurs. They're done. We're the winners. We're the dominating ones. And they became unbalanced. Rachel Maddow, let's give a show to this freak and that freak and this freak and that freak and that. And it just became unbalanced and so people got sick of it they isolated a huge chunk of the of the western population sure there's tons of liberals out there but in america there's tens of millions of people who are somewhat conservative or are conservative or are leading right in some ways leaning right in some ways and we've isolated not me but the mainstream has isolated those people and so what happened well things have to balance themselves or things will react in an extreme way and so elon musk comes in and says i'll buy x i'll buy twitter and i'll give you guys a voice you guys don't have a oh my phone hold on you believe that guys i'm doing a video and i get a spam call. i'm not exaggerating i'm not joking i get a spam call it's like when i'm doing a video the hackers over there in india the scammers over there in india they want to try to undermine what i'm doing here they're trying to sabotage me anyway Elon Musk comes along and he says, I'll, I'll buy X. I'll give you guys a voice. YouTube used to be, YouTube I think is a lot less, a lot less censoring nowadays. I, I really feel that. I really believe that. I could be wrong, but I get the sense, I'm getting the impression that YouTube has a lot less censorship now than it did uh, 10 years ago. I remember the days back in 2000 and, uh, 2018. I mean, you would use the word trans in a negative way and pff, the video was gone and they, 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 they would take the video down uh but elon musk says hey you don't have a voice on youtube here's x rumble comes along and says hey you can't say what you want to say on youtube here's rumble here's bit shoot and so people started to go to other online spaces and those online spaces are filled with right-wing fanatics yes but that's the danger behind not supporting balance when you don't support balance people become unbalanced and then they go to the extreme on the opposite side and this this is what tends to happen before hitler took power what was germany germany was a shithole it was extremely poor. I mean, they lost oh, they lost World War One, so of course. But it was just filled with liberalism and feminists, and these people were crazy, and they were pushing transgenderism, and there was all this sick shit that was happening. There were people trying to push communism, and it was nasty. And so people were looking for a solution to the problem. In comes Hitler. And people subscribed to destructive, fanatical beliefs. And that's what we're seeing, guys. We are seeing the peasants building up their anger 
getting more and more extreme. And I'm afraid that there's going to be a backlash in the Western world and it's going to be ugly. That's my fear. And people are sick and tired of the interventionism. They're sick and tired of the neoliberalism slash neoconservatism. They're sick and tired of all that stuff. And I think there's going to be a major backlash in the future because people are saying, listen, enough is enough. You're, you're killing us with the excessive migrations. And now you want to kill us in a war with Russia. And, and people are going to, there's going to be a crazy backlash. That's, that's my belief. Anyway, you guys just heard some Theo Logi. God bless. <laughs>